now we are going to do a uh, lighting talk for the Gold Summer of Code students. Remember that they are new to the community and we welcome with them. Uh, I hope that uh, when we finish, uh, you approach them and, and ask them what they are doing and, and you know. Um, so we will start with the Gold Summer of Code and Richie, and then we will move to two newcomers that are not from internships, but they have an interest, uh, interesting story to, to say. So we start with you, Lem. Uh, man. Uh, yeah, that's, that's good. Okay. Yeah. Everybody. Get, getting set, set up. How are you doing? Do you like the weather? Me too. It's much better than uh, Manchester. <laughs> we had luck. We had luck. Whatever. Um, hi, I'm Julian. Can I start? Yep. I'm Julian. I'm doing my Google Summer of Code on Fraxel. On Fraxel, you definitely heard about it. Uh, it's a native client for Matrix written in Rust and GTK. Go ahead. Thank you. A little bit something about myself. I'm a computer science student. I think about myself as a thinker and a hacker at heart because I like to disassemble everything, like to get into it, to look at the code, but also to the hardware, like I disassembled all my laptops I had till now. And also I'm a cyborg. If you want to know more about that, ask me later. Go ahead, thank you. Um, so some st uh, stats, what I have been doing the last five months since February. I have been working on uh, Fractal. I wrote uh, n more than 9,000 lines of code and uh, also deleted a lot of code, like 4, 000, 4, more than 4,000 lines of code that makes up to 13,000 uh, changes overall, which is quite interesting. Uh, go ahead. So this is the state uh, Freckle was in before I started. They already started improving the UI thanks to the awesome designer we have on the project. Um, next slide, please. So this is how it looks right now. We have awesome pictures. No, we have a much better inline viewer, which uh, was done by Daniel and my mentor, and Asia. I have mainly worked on the user account settings. You can check out yourself. Um, also, no, sorry. And also the header bar changed a lot, and we made a lot of small fixes and changes. So what brings the near future, like tomorrow or so? Um, yeah, next slide, thank you. Um, we have, for now, we added uh, user account settings uh, like a month ago. And I have a work in progress branch with the account settings. And that's a small screenshot of it, a small part. You can also already change uh, configurations and stuff like you can do in Riot. And we have also an awesome uh, members list, which works well with more than 5,000 users, which is really impressive. And that's, that's all for now. And we will definitely work on it. Thanks for your attention. Roxy? Oh, welcome to Rosandra. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Urksandra, and I'm doing my GUSOC project on five or more under the mentorship of Robert Roth, who unfortunately isn't here today. Um, so if you haven't heard of five or more, um, five or more is a game in which you have to match um, the same shape and color of an object in order to make them disappear and thus score as many points as possible. Um, 
As objectives, uh, we would like, obviously, to write the code uh, in Vala um, to <laughs> uh, while uh, also providing a fresh uh, interface, um, keeping uh, the model and the view separated because right now it was all crowded in the same class, and uh, also integrate some new features such as libgnome game support or add sound and um, gamepad support for extra fun. Um, as a result, by now I have uh, managed to rewrite um, individually the modules. There has been um, an old port to Vala, but that was uh, four years ago and it was really outdated, so it would have been hard to maintain it and um, fast forward it to where it is now. Um, also, I have ported the application menu and the preferences window. Unfortunately, there have been a new, um, new design um, guidelines and the preferences window needs a bit more updating. Um, also, I have ported the application window and um, separated the game logic from drawing and UI. As I've told you, it was pretty crowded in there. Um, these are some screenshots. I guess you can see something. Um, in the first, uh, to the right, left, um, uh, there's the preference menu. Um, the next one is the application window. Right now you can see at the top part there's the widget and that the user click uh, the next um, shapes are rendered inside the game panel. Um, uh, in the future I pl plan on uh, writing a pathfinding algorithm to be able to play the game, obviously. Uh, implementing both uh, score and high score systems and also adding the extras such as sound and gamepad support. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Oh yeah. So welcome to Alex. Hello everyone. Um, my name is Alexandro Fazakas, or Fazakas as most of you would likely pronounce it. And this summer I'll be working on Nautilus, implementing both unit and integration tests, uh, working on profiling, cover T report, and um, reworking or eventually rewriting uh, the debugging framework of Nautilus. Um, under, my, under the mentorship of this guy, Carlos Soriano, you probably know him. <laughs> um, so some things um, that I that we outline here. Um, why would I ever want to test anything? Was basically how I started working on this project, and it's the same question I still ask myself whenever I commit something onto the actual project. Um, one of the bigger um, bigger reasons we're working on this would be first performance wise. Um, this also includes memory leaking, as mentioned, but this would uh, and this would probably be um, dealt with through prof profiling and debugging. Um, we also want to prevent regression, which I've actually recently bumped into working on a related bug, um, which eventually we hope would offer support to f uh, to fellow contributors in the future in order to you know not mess something fundamental up when working on anything. <laughs> and easier debugging, which would actually really help me if it were implemented by now, but still. Um, how did I start working on it? So obviously most of the operations in Nautilus are asynchronous. They're using some other thread which, um, well, that's actually not worth talking into. So they're asynchronous, but in order to test them, I started by providing synchronous alternatives to the operations we were testing. Um, so most of um, most of the tests first involved um, first involved uh, a synchronous alternative. Um, I mentioned here modularity, readability, and functionality, which we uh, also want to provide with a test. Um, the most the most work we've actually put in the 
first larger committed test was in order to set up a, an example for the following operation, operations which we would, uh, which we, we would use eventually. Um, so what's come out of all the work I did on this project? Um, that code is not something I introduced, it's something we figured along the way while testing everything by hand. Um, baby steps on setting an example. As I said, we, uh, assuming there's more work uh, in the future being put into this, there's some guidelines we, will, we would want to set for this uh, kind of tests. Um, to do would be contributor support. As I said, we want to um, encourage people and make it easier to work on Nautilus and to figure out, to figure out if anything has, broken, has been broken along the way. And I guess, more or less, we want to figure out why, why performance, why someone would choose something over Nautilus. Um, and that would be my presentation. Thank you for being here. Ivan? No. So welcome to Ivan. Um, hello. I'm Ivan Maladeskich. I am a Google Summer of Code student. I'm uh, helping Federico support uh, Libar SVG filters to Rust. Uh, so Libar SVG is a library for rendering scalable vector graphics. Uh, in GNOME, it's used mostly for rendering icons, but it's also used in Wikipedia and uh, uh, some other projects. For example, there is a rhythm game called Performance, which uh, uses Libar SVG to render uh, all of its UI. So its UI elements are SVGs, and uh, we use it to render it. Uh, so uh, filter effects are actually uh, raster transformations uh, for uh, pixel bitmaps. Uh, which uh, may come uh, surprising because like uh, scalable vector graphics format and raster operations, but uh, it's something, it's part of the standard. So there are some operations like uh, Gaussian blur or uh, simple compositing. Uh, also there is uh, some interesting stuff like uh, displacement of pixels based on other image data. Uh, filter effects are composed of individual filter primitives. Uh, so for example, um, on this uh, uh, filter example image, uh, there's a Gaussian blur primitive. Uh, it takes uh, the alpha channel to, and blurs it to create a shadow. Then, uh, it's, then the shadow is offset to the uh, bottom right a little. Uh, and then there is a specular lighting primitive for the glare and a merge filter to merge them all to the same image. Uh, so the way uh, filter primitives are represented in C and uh, is a big struct uh, with a bunch of common properties like uh, X, Y width height, uh, and uh, strings for in and result. And uh, uh, you can see there are some uh, uh, booleans for X specified, Y specified, uh, because there is uh, a piece of logic uh, that we want to take uh, based on whether the values were specified or not. But uh, it's actually uh, a little inconvenient to work with in C. Uh, because you can forget to check for the specified variable. So in Rust, there is a nice abstraction called option. Uh, it may be either set to some value or set to nothing. And if it's set to nothing, you can't get uh, any value out of it. Uh, and then uh, there is also the uh, render function uh, that uh, takes the input pixel data and uh, does something with it. Uh, in C, is stored just as a function pointer inside the struct. And in Rust, uh, it's uh, represented nicely as a trait uh, with a method. Uh, the Rust method is also nice because uh, you can return, you can easily return an error. Uh, so in C, in, uh, in the C version, the errors were ignored. So uh, we don't know uh, what caused an error if an error happens. And in Rust, we return it and we can see it. Uh, also, another interesting thing is uh, how you can create uh, different abstractions. For example, in filters, uh, a lot of times you want to iterate over individual pixels, and uh, in C uh, it's uh, just a normal loop over uh, Y and X, and also over the color channels uh, with a uh, really scary looking equation that's uh, very easy to get wrong. And uh, in Rust uh, I added a, a pixel iterator. So you create it and it, uh, it uh, yields you uh, the pixel values along, along with its coordinates. and. Uh, uh, it's uh, pretty much uh, error pr it's very error prone. And you can also combine it with uh, standard Rust iterator combinators. So for example, if I have two images, I want to get pixels out of uh, both of images and uh, do some processing, I can use the map combinator and uh, I'll get the pixel with the same coordinates from the second image and process it. Uh, and uh, another thing uh, we added uh, recently is uh, support for uh, different 
uh, sRGB color spaces, so linear and uh, linear RGB and sRGB, and so filters work properly with those now. And uh, next up, um, uh, I'm planning to uh, finish uh, porting the remaining filters, and then uh, maybe look at doing something exciting like uh, simmed acceleration for the operations. Uh, uh, that's it. Uh, thank you for your attention. Hey, so there welcome we to Evan. Okay, okay. So, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Evan Welsh. Um, I am a Google Summer of Code intern, and I'm also work on some open source software as a student at Cornell University. Um, if you see me on IRC or Matrix, you've seen me under the tag Rockon999. I do GNOME Shell extension development too. Um, so, essentially, my project is improving the GJS or GNOME JavaScript developer experience. Um, yay, JavaScript. We'll get to that. Uh, next slide, please. So the developer experience of GGS as it stood maybe about a year ago or general common knowledge as of today. Um, so people say, this blog says I should do this in GGS or I should look at the C documentation or wait, should I be looking at the Volidoc or maybe uh, Polari does this but the shell does it this way. So how am I supposed to develop in GGS is kind of the question and the answer for the past few years has been uh, a giant question mark or conflicting answers. Um, and so if you could go to the next slide. Um, so my project has been utilizing a multi-prong um, approach to improving that. Um, so first of all, we have documentation. Um, so the currently available documentation is static generated documentation on uh, Giovanni's um, website, um, some C documentation, and actually there is currently a live instance of a DevDocs, um, which is an open source documentation platform um, that runs the different um, GNOME bindings. The issue being that it's not necessarily integrated um, fully into the GNOME experience. There are a few bugs and it also um, hadn't been worked on for about two years. It had been a project of my men one of my mentors, um, Philip, Philip Comento. Um, so I have improved that, brought it into like kind of the GNOME realm, um, fixed bugs, made it more reliable. Um, we've also been developing example applications, so ex uh, applications that demonstrate to people how to develop in GJS, um, along with those tutorials to accompany them. And also finally we have the advancement of features. So essentially um, in JavaScript, if you don't know, um, it has gained many features in the past few years using language versions like ES4, ES5, ES6. Um, we're moving on to ES7, ES8. So I've actually got um, Babel, which is a compilation, uh, JavaScript down compiling platform, if you don't know, to fully run in the GGS and Mason stack. Um, so next, so this is what um, a typical DevDocs instance looks like without any GNOME patches, any GNOME um, experience improvements. And if you go to the next slide, this is essentially what we've been working on to bring it into the GNOME world. So GNOME branding, um, the ability to search easily through GNOME um, platforms. Right here you can see an example of App Indicator 3, which is one of the libraries you'd find on most GNOME um, documentation platforms. Um, so if you can see um, it, it documents everything, puts it really cleanly, um, you can easily scroll through, find things. It essentially brings GJS documentation into the modern realm and into the GNOME realm. I'll make you go to the next slide. So this is an example application um, uh, that we've been working on. Um, and it's really, this is just really sparse because it's to illustrate one single point. Um, so if you could flip between this slide and the previous slide just for a second. Um, no, sorry. Then go to this one, the next slide, and then go back. And if you look at the header bar, um, if you look at the header, if you can keep fli flipping back once or twice. So essentially this demonstrates responsive header bar design um, to left and right um, window decorations. And a problem with some initial developing applications or just GNOME um, applications in general is that oftentimes the header bar can break when the user changes button configurations. So this application demonstrates and gives a tutorial on how to properly um, design header bars so that they are responsive to buttons. And you can see examples of this in um, Polari, um, good examples that is. And thank you. Um, yeah, that's my email, fairly self explanatory. Feel free to talk to me later. Thank you. So, welcome to Avi. Cool. So, um, I'll be, my name is Avi Zion, and I'm an outreach intern. My mentor is Philip Comento over there. Um, I'm currently working on GJS and Go Object Introspection with modernizing. Um, GJS with promises and async await. Um, so my method ha so far has been implementing the head utility where you have like the 10 lines print out. So that's how I've been beginning understanding how everything works together. So from 
that I've been using also MDN and the GNOME documentation for the most part. I also learned the hard way <laughs> after a week of banging my head on the wall to ask for help if I need it, <laughs> if I get stuck. Um, so with that, uh, I've been working on this thing like quite a few times. Um, so it started out with one implementation with like function head, then my params and like the rest of the function. But then I've been implementing it, like I modernized it to ES6. And from there I learned a few other new tricks with um, JavaScript, which has been really uh, fun for me at least. And I also had to create ESLint rules because I don't use any spaces between all my stuff. Um, but so my issue basically from my head implementation was that I've been using load contents async and finish as an example, which are callbacks that are nested typically. So something I had to do was create something called load contents promise where I had the um, GIO.file with um, my async and my finish functions uh, together so that way it's kind of hiding it from everyone else so you no longer have to like call and do a callback but then from there we went and moved on to making it into an actual separate function so it became promiseify. Um, so an issue I had was when I was creating the promiseify factory function was that I had four parameters from load contents promise when I was moving into a factory function and so I had like a new function name and so from there I had to uh, monkey patch it which I learned how to do also. Um, so that way you don't have to do that and it now uses just simply the async name so load contents async and you don't have to do finish at all. But another issue is with the promiseify function I made going into the overrides at some point. Uh, it, no, I have to make sure that the um, if you use like a callback versus if you want to make sure it's in the promiseify version, um, you have to make sure like it knows which one. So I had to figure out how to do that also. So now it can tell like basically if you want a callback, then it won't touch your code. But if you want to use the new method with only calling load contents async and then having the cancelable inside of it, and that's it, then it'll recognize it. So that will eventually be in the overrides. But uh, my next step at this point is working on GoObject introspection with issue number 28 if you look into it. Uh, it's working on the um, GNOME async result with adding a finish function to the async, like any function that has async after it, like uh, underscore async, and then for finish it would be um, async func and that would be in the gear file for the methods. Um, but that's what I've been currently working on. So, but yeah, that's me. So, thank you. This is my first time to Europe. My parents were afraid I'm real lost. Uh, thanks to God, I haven't lost myself and, and yet. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Liu Jiahui. You could call me Jiahui. Uh, uh, I come, I come, I come from Xi'an, China. I'm in the, I'm in the Xi'an Linux group. I'm a so, so far in software engineering student. I'm a real party. Uh, it's my great, great pleasure to successfully apply for just uh, and uh, the project is GNOME Logs. I will introduce it, uh, it later. Uh, I love it. I love traveling and it out port. Okay. Uh, uh, I say that there are a lot of uh, familiar faces uh, in the audience. Uh, maybe maybe we we have seen each other last year. Uh, last, uh, last October, I participated in the GNOME Asia Summit held in Chongqing University. It was my first time in clo close contact to the GNOME. Community, the whole meeting is very nice, nice, nice people, nice speeches, nice, nice hot pot. It's really a special experience. Uh, in the, in that, in that lighting talk, uh, a speaker, a speaker introduced just so said to us, I was particularly interested in it. After, after his speech, I got his contact information from the from starting chatting to apply for the associate 2018 successfully. I think the application experience should be similar to other students who here to omit it, uh, omit 100 hundred uh, words. And today, I took part, uh, I take part, I take two part in graduate uh, with with that speaker, my enthusiastic uh, uh, tutor. Jason Ka and uh, David, David King. Uh, how lucky I was. Thank you very much for your giving me a lot of help. Uh, okay, by, by the way, last month I took part in the student of uh, the open source conference in Trinity University. I did a speech, speech and introduced GSOC and the GNOME, com GNOME community to them. It makes me happy and honored. 
uh, and, and my project GNOME logs logs the view for the system journal logs current does not update the view when new log message are added to the journal. My work is fixing it. Fixing this should make it easier to fix several other bugs. With the help of my tutors, I have got a new log message successfully. But I have some some problems with adding these in the in the model. I'm trying to save them. Uh, I would like to thank. Uh, okay. Uh, I would like to th thanks to my tutors, the GNOME Foundation, and sincere thanks for your attention. Thanks for. All. So welcome to Adi. Oh, it's working. You don't have to go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, hello everyone. I'm a new contributor to the GNOME community, and I'm part of the Google Summer of Code 2018 roster. That's my project. So let's get started. That's a fairly standard Linux command. That's my legal name, which my parents gave to me upon birth. I have a degree in electronics engineering. I'm passionate about computer architecture, microprocessors, and recently deep learning. And I'm really, really interested in power management in Linux. So that brings me to this project. Moving ahead, why this project? This is a common user case scenario. I face this scenario on the flight to Madrid. I face this scenario. Oh, sorry. So I faced this scenario on the flight to Madrid, and this one, it was right before the GSOC application submission deadline. And this one, I have not, I don't know, you never know the good times in life. So uh, after facing all of this, I came to, I wanted to do some research on batteries, and I realized power batteries are really, really efficient. At least that's, the that's what the manufacturers want us to believe. But they're not smart enough. They don't give you any data. They just deliver the power, and that's it. Linux is often blamed for having a poor battery life. My friends, to whom I've recommend, uh, recommended Linux, they come back to me and say, dude, where's, where's my battery? So yeah, this is, this is a bone of contention. For this, via this project, I want to tell the users which application and which hardware device is actually consuming your battery and how you can improve it. Because when you can, when you can pinpoint the issue, that's when you can fix it. That's basic Amdahl's law. For this project, I also did some case studies on how there are other similar implementations. This is how Windows 10 handles it. Windows 10 uses a service called Energy, uh, Energy Interface Engine. It's something based in the kernel. I'm not really sure about its details, but I did attend some papers about it. This is fairly standard screen, which we all have seen in Android. Android also handles it via the kernel. This is via iOS. It is quite, I think it is much more simpler than Android, which is as expected. Now comes what I am doing for this project. This is the final prospective panel, which will be shipped to the users, hopefully by 3.30 release cycle. This is the panel design, and this represents the battery life. This represents the time, uh, the time for the time scale, and these represent the applications as well as the hardware devices. If we can present this information to the user in a reliable manner, I think it's, it's really useful for the developers and for the users. Well, thank you for this opportunity. So now we have finished the, the Google Summer of Code interns and the Orichi. And now is uh, welcome to the newcomers that are not interns. Yeah. So welcome, welcome to Avi. Oi. No. Yeah. So hello, I'm Avi Wada, a 15-year-old who's a free software enthusiast. Oh, could you go slide back? Yeah. So um, my IB personal project is to build a website called LibreHunt to help you choose a Unix distro. So um, you know, so why would I? So um, 
take it from the perspective of my newbie friends. They just want to get into Linux, but they don't have the time to distro hop. So when they start off, uh, next slide, they see Ubuntu, and that's like a common choice. And then they see, next slide, elementary, and then uh, Deepin, and then there's Solus, and then there's Zorin, Linux Mint, and um, Debian. They're, these are like, only from the perspective of a newbie, there are already so many choices, and it's hard to choose which one. So I think my website will help in that user case at least. So uh, right now my code's on GitLab. It's um, I'm starting out. I plan to build it during these this during this week. Um, yeah, hopefully get to finish it by this month. Thank you. Hello. Well, I guess the slides don't really matter. I only have one slide, which is oh yeah, which is. <laughs> oh wait, which is actually turned the wrong way. That's great. Thank you, Inkscape. <laughs> perfect, perfect. So, <laughs> welcome to Tobias. Great. Uh, so I mean, I'm, yeah, you can turn it actually. Sure. So, uh, I, don't, I don't think that's the problem. Yes. Um, so, I'm not like strictly a newcomer, but I've not been with the project for that long. Uh, so, this, like, Carlos asked me to kind of like give a quick overview of basically my past year with the project. So, I've been a GNOME user for a very long time and like very interested in the project for like years. And I've wanted to start contributing and like I went to conferences and like talked to, to people like, I remember I, I met Bastion at FOSDEM like two years ago or something. It was like, I really want to contribute, but then like kind of never happened. And then like last year, Julian and I finally came to Guadec after years. Um, and that sort of kind of ended up working. And then like over the fall, I started getting more, oh, so actually, just like briefly on my background, I'm a designer. Um, I like study computer science, so I'm like sort of in between design and development. Um, and I've been in free software, yeah, for a long time. But like, um, basically, like coming to Guadex essentially made it happen for me, and like I stuck with the project and started actually contributing to stuff. Um, I worked with Georgie's uh, on Todo like last fall, and that sort of, I think, got me started on the workflow. And then like Fractal happened, and um, like a bunch of other apps, and now I'm sort of, I guess, designing six, seven apps, and they all like. Would, would like me to be more present. And it's, it's kind of within a year, I've gone from like basically not contributing actively at all to like, yeah, um, designing like six, seven apps. And then obviously, like in, in the spring, um, I, I, so I graduated in March. And right after that, got hired by Purism um, to, to work on the Librem 5 project, which I'm going to have a talk about uh, on Sunday. Um, but so like basically just like as a, as a maybe inspirational story for the newcomers, like within a year a lot can happen. Like you can go from like wishing to have gone to Guadec like the last few years and not really knowing how to contribute actively to actually sort of working on GNOME as your job. And I think that's maybe an interesting prospect uh, for you guys and maybe interesting for the rest of the project kind of like as a background. So yeah. Um, Thanks so much, and enjoy the rest of the conference. So yeah, um, this was the newcomers. I want to say thank you to, to you all, because I think the projects you do are really nice, even if it's internships or whatever, or people like, for example, uh, Avi, who is 15 years old and is doing code and you know, involved in Nom already here in Wadek. And then we have Tobias that, as you can see, in seven months, he has, he, he has been from just contributing a little to working full-time on GNOME. So yeah, thank you very much for that, and welcome to, to the GNOME community.